Hello. So today I am talking to Celine Moran, who is a associate professor at the University of Paris Nanterre. Hello, Celine. Hello, Mom. Morning, Paul. How are you? <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. Thank you for agreeing to 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 talk to me today. So, um, Celine is. We met like ten years ago. Yeah. So there was a big cultural studies conference in Paris, and you were on the organizing team. Um, and you already kind of hated me before I arrived because I remember I was emailing all the time asking about can we have an institutional subscription yeah. what discounts <laughs> <laughs> and, and no one on the committee knew how to answer my annoying questions I have completely repressed yeah. <laughs> memory of that so that's good because yeah. I remember when we met you, you were like oh you're poor boy <laughs> and I was like, yeah sorry about that sorry about the emails but then we got on okay um, and we talked cultural studies, we've met a few times since, and then um, we chatted recently when I was doing an online lecture thing somewhere, and you now have been, so you've been working on really interesting cultural theory, gender, media stuff, and you have a growing interest in, in issues around intimacy and martial arts as well. Could, so how, how did that kind of start? How did you start thinking about martial arts? Um... From, from a personal perspective, I guess, uh, by, by becoming a practitioner, you know, I started Wing Chun like two, three years ago, well, just before COVID. Mm -hmm. so I will let you guess what happened. Um, and then I started Kaju Kembo, uh, which I've done for like twice a week for a few months now. And, um, but really, in a way, starting martial arts was indeed a, a continuation, a natural extension of, you know, those years of research on intimacy and, and gender, on feminism and individualism, on tradition and modernities. Mm -hmm. So I, I have been working on intimacies within the public sphere. So I, I did my PhD on media representations of love. And since then, I've started working on health controversies online uh, regarding sexual transmission of viruses or sexual abuse. Um, I've studied masculinism and intimacy. So there is kind of a cross fertilization of mm. martial arts studies and, and, and intimacy issues that were really quick to appear when I started practicing martial arts. Um, yeah. And especially, you know, what practice tell us about limits, frontiers, spheres, distance um and and about performances of intimacies yeah i mean this is this is this is not something that i ever thought about i mean i've i've done i've practiced different martial arts most of my life i guess but i've never done a kind of wrestling grappling thing mm -hmm. so when i started doing brazilian jiu-jitsu there's a meet you immediately come up against this the way in which your body is actually quite closely policed and there are distances but in Brazilian jiu-jitsu that's all transgressed straight away and, and you're strangers and you're hugging and you're grappling with people's thighs and their arms and then you're face to face and you're and it's it, and, and straight away there's a, an intimacy that is not present anywhere else in life even not even in lots of martial arts I mean there's a kind of intimacy where if you're holding the pads and you're punching and or you're doing something like that but nothing quite for me, the same as as that kind of wrestling type contact, um, and it, it really got me thinking about this extra dimension. People think that martial arts are kind of violent, but actually, in the moment of training, there's an awful lot more going on. I mean, wh what do you think about that? Well, I, I, I well, on, on the, I've, I've never tried any. I, although in Kashyambo, there's a lot of a bit of jujitsu so you know there's ground training but it's not like an hour or two hours of exclusively ground training and i can only imagine how intimate you know that must feel and um, um at the same time how intimacy can quickly become a second thing on the mind because you're just doing something else at the mm -hmm. time but i think distance whether it's even whether it's you know quite uh, quite large distance between people in fighting or very close distance in wrestling. On the mat, we, we, we see, we feel, we experience, we struggle with 
distance, right? Yeah. Whether you, you get too close or too far, that's a, um, that's a basic social interaction that regulates intimacy. Uh, and, and that is maybe even before getting hit or strangled or before hitting someone or wrestling with someone, that is the first um, transgression, social transgression of the training. Um, but, but then, and that is what really hit me when I, when I was starting martial arts. Um, intimacy and then sex, love are used themselves to regulate public and private uh, in our societies. So what, what happens when you mix you know, those two things, when you transgress distances and therefore intimacies while considering that that has to have an effect on the very notion of public and, 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 and private. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, when, once you start to think about intimacy as well, it, it transforms the way that you think about martial arts because people think, I think the easiest assumption to make is that martial arts are a kind of individual practice. It's not a team sport. It's an individual, it's like, so I am interacting with an opponent, even if it's really collaborative, it's still about, people think it's me versus them, me versus you. But as a matter of fact, it's an incredibly collaborative community. That, that classroom, the dojo or the, the whatever you call the training hall, the gym, it, it is a really strong community and people start to kind of discuss their vulnerabilities or they say, I can't do this because I've got a sore back or, or I've got an injury here. And people start to really you know, open up about, about things like, I, I, I'm sorry today, I'm useless because I've got these problems in life. But like, you know, so it's, it, it, once you start to add intimacy into the mix, it really transforms the way we think about this kind of practice that it's easy to say it's individual, but it's not, it's, it's, it's very different to individualism, right? Yeah. And it goes back to what you were saying about the violence. I think a lot of people see martial arts as this kind of competitive training, the me versus the other and the violence. Um, that was maybe one of the first warnings that I got from people around me, you know, what I, why are you getting into this? It's mm. such, such a violent practice along with, you know, careful recommendations about not hurting myself and not hurting my body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't, you know, or don't, don't, don't get too muscular or don't break your nose. You know? That was the kind of... Don't get too aggressive. Don't yeah. get too <laughs> Okay. Um, but it, it's a very, yeah, indeed, it's a very collaborative practice. I remember uh, training with someone who was not really helping me and the instructor came along and said, you're not very, to, to the other person, you're not being a very good sparring partner. You have to do mm -hmm. the work to help her. So it's not, of course, not just my feeding and listening. There are a lot of things happening in this, in this collaboration. And so that is why I think it can be understood as a space where people will come and try new things, changing uh, ways of behaviors, um, mm -hmm. testing like micro interactions, reflecting on uh, reflexes, uh, you know, uh, learned behaviors. I guess it, I mean, thinking about that in your example of the bad training partner, the person who's just gonna try and smash you or, or you know, just they're all about themselves, they're all about winning or they're, <clears throat> I mean, in, I think we might be limiting our thinking to, to types of martial arts practice where it's, it's formal, it's commercial, and it's in the instructor's best interests to encourage people to continue. So in, so re, I mean, until I started to do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I was doing a screamer and in, like the jujitsu is a business. I mean, these are people who are making their living from it. So they want to be inclusive. They don't want to put up any barriers. They want women. They want, you know, non-binary. They, they want multiple ethnic. That's what they want because it looks good on photographs. It's a good ethos. It encourages people not to be afraid to walk in the door. But before that, when I was training a screamer, that was very kind of it wasn't anti-capitalist but it was like no we're doing this to be good at doing this 
And if you're not tough enough, then we don't want you here. So there was less intimacy there because it was very much a kind of brutalizing and brutalized thing where you walk in that door and that in itself is an act of courage because in that room, it, there is going to be pain. Um, so maybe this, you know, the, the new, the, this ethos of intimacy is something that is kind of generated by the consumerist ethos, the inclusive ethos, which I'm, so I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but maybe, maybe in earlier times, in other places, uh, you don't get that intimacy. You just get the bad, tra every training partner is a bad training partner because they're about me and I'm gonna smash you, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe? Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. And, and you know, martial arts is not by essence something that is inclusive or progressive or that works with intimacies in a, in a, in a good way. But I would say that it works with intimacies in maybe maybe a positive way positive not meaning that it's good but positive meaning that it's it, it creates something it's <clears throat> profoundly creative and it it can be a kind of a, a, a safe space where you can do that and safe does not mean that you won't be hit because well or that you won't get hurt in any way because you probably will at some point mm -hmm. um and it may be physically emotionally um narcissistically <laughs> or all of them at once uh but space means uh a space where you can find you can it doesn't mean that you will or that they will be the good partners but when you can potentially find partners who will engage with you in new forms of uh, public intimacies uh, and 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 if you're lucky enough, uh, playful intimacies. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I was just thinking. Um, I mean, I was thinking about the the violence aspect of it and its relation to intimacy. But the other thing that I definitely want to ask you about, so I'll ask you about it sooner, is so people think that some martial arts are really kind of macho, right? They have that kind of male vibe to them that might be mma that might be you know kickboxing Thai boxing that kind of thing now you've done a lot of work on what you call the manosphere the manosphere tell tell us tell us what that is what's the manosphere um the manosphere is uh, a sphere within what some people have called uh, in french at least uh, la fachosphere which was a uh, all the uh, far right uh, uh, movements online. Um, and so the manosphere uh, regroups really all sorts of uh, networks and discourses around masculinist and anti feminist uh, ideologies. Um, and it's, it's really interesting because it's at least on, not, not, you know, it's anti feminism. Uh, was born with feminism. The two went on one with the other. Uh, but online, it's it's a sphere that is quite new, quite recent. Uh, and so it was really interesting these last years. Uh, we've done this project for four years now um, to watch it build itself uh, online in relation to far right online movements, but also quite autonomously. So in what way is it self-aware or deliberate? Is it, is it do you just, because you're, you're mapping it, you're kind of trying to map this mm. area and have a cartography of it. In what way is it just that you're finding people online who are incredibly, you know, um, anti-feminist and homophobic and macho and, 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 and all the rest of it? And in what way is it a, a definite network of alliances you know it, the term manosphere that's that's your term not the academic term right so in what way is it a is it a self-conscious unity is it sort of or is it just cr clusters and groups of people who please themselves by sharing their ideas with each other and nodding at each other and go yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't like these women and we don't like these foreigners and we don't like these these gays and so on I mean, what exactly is going on in terms of kind of conscious projects there? Yeah. Okay. To be honest, I didn't coin the term manosphere. 
uh, it was already there in the in the literature. Uh, um, but but you're right, and it's a very interesting question, you know, to to try to decipher if it's a very strong network and strong discourses, or if it's just some kind of you know groups online mm -hmm. just exchanging it. I think. It's it's um it, it goes to well the, the, the far right as long uh, you know put its interest on the the public sphere if we can say so that is you know developing sort of xenophobia sort of hate of foreigners um, but they are taking of taking upon the the idea of the private sphere and the fact that love and sexualities since uh, since you know the 50s 60s mm. through the work of feminist movements have been profoundly uh, uh, uh have profoundly changed you know uh, working towards uh, more equal arrangements uh working mm. toward gender roles deconstruction etc so the manosphere really is like a sub sphere where they really dive into um, personal insatisfactions. Uh, um, so they're sharing lots and lots and lots of anecdotes online about you know, whether I paid for the house and now it's all okay. hers. Um, um, I, I, I don't take care of the kids, but that's because she's way better at it than okay. I am. Um, um, we don't uh, we don't have sex anymore, but uh, that was part of the deal. So she's not fulfilling uh, what she's supposed to do. So the state should uh, and then, or I have trouble uh, seducing women, and uh, the state should you know assign a woman to a man. Those are kind of the solutions you know that go around uh, yeah. in the well. So the idea clearly uh, within these spheres and these discourses and these interactions. And even within the online networks, that is who goes who, who comments where, uh, yeah. what are the links between the YouTube channels and the yeah. YouTube videos. Um, the idea clearly is to, for them is to draw uh, a, a kind of a conclusions, but also, you know, to discuss together as to why they're feeling so disempowered and mm. in the end, quite miserable. Okay, so it's 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 familiar forms of n kind of new newly networked misogyny and resentment. So everything from incels to kind of yeah, all of the rest of it. Um, and is there, have you found a a connection? Any connections between martial arts? Because there's there are some obvious. There's an elephant in the room that I'm not going to mention. Um, which is that kind of manly yeah. MMA kind of, um, you know, reflex kind of febrile masculinity position. I mean, have you, are there any, there's also, um, there's a kind of a little sub theme in, in actually quite mainstream British, definitely British, definitely English language journalism, which regularly makes a strong connection between MMA clubs and the rise of the far right, like right wing populisms, right wing nationalisms, and you know using or, or MMA clubs being breeding grounds and recruitment areas for this kind of ethos. Have you noticed anything like that? Is there any strong connection between martial arts and 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 the manosphere? Well, it's interesting. I was there are multiple ways to answer your question. The first one is. There is a kind of a tropism toward tradition, of course, in the manosphere, you know, fantasized, idealized uh, period of time where things were better. Um, and they, they, they quote classic philosophers very frequently, for example, which is a way of, you know, uh, going mm. back to your time. Um, but from what I read, which is mainly the French manosphere, I haven't seen I, I was actually surprised to don't uh, to, to not find any kind of orientalism, but that's probably because I don't know. Maybe the, the xenophobia is so strong that there's really 
no attraction whatsoever for this side of martial arts. Mm -hmm. What I have seen, however, is men who give, of course, a huge importance to values of masculinities, such as strength, speed, uh, and that goes all the way, and that's quite interesting, uh, to uh, being muscular and being in good health. And there you can find a lot of content that criticize uh, Big Pharma. Uh, okay. So, or even people commenting uh, together on one's appearance and the ways to improve their appearance through martial arts. So, okay. Also, so there, is, there are those kind of aesthetic and thematic connections, strength, self-strengthening, yeah. strong body, strong mind. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you don't need to take vaccines or medications because, and, and there is a kind of connection to that counter. So you've got the kind of countercultural thing of strengthen your body, eat natural, um, and then also the kind of, kind of quasi or quasi fascist aesthetics, kind of Olympian uh, aesthetics that yeah. you know much beloved by the Nazis, um, because it's about strengthening the, the man, strengthen the nation, strengthen the people these old ideas, um, yeah, yeah they, 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 they slot into each other so comfortably, don't they? They're so, they're like made for each other, which is, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good what you say. It's good that you say you haven't really seen any strong connections with martial arts because, you know, I, I, I wonder about this journalism that says, oh, so, okay, I can accept that you're going to have far right fascist fight clubs racist one you're going to but you're also going to have anti-fascist action fight clubs you're going to have feminist fight clubs you're going to have completely apolitical cosmopolitan fight clubs and i i don't i'm glad that you say it's not an obvious movement or there's not an obvious that's a good answer <laughs> that's an answer <laughs> that makes me kind of happy and the rest of the stuff is is quite predictable too i mean we all slide into it i mean during the the pandemic i've said this before i've said this more than once in the first months of the pandemic when there were no vaccines and we didn't know if there would ever be vaccines and everyone's worried about their their breath and their health i kind of got into that stuff as well like breathing and you think okay and i started to take vitamin d now not because there was a there was a connection between that and not getting covid it was because it helped with mood so for me it was stress anxiety being depressed you know but I found that all the hippie stuff all the breathing stuff I was also thinking yeah this could this could strengthen me against covid by having strong lungs and everything but also it was just making me happy <laughs> so that was the main thing it was something to do that made me feel quite good <clears throat> okay so intimacies in martial arts are you going to work on your own martial arts practice and theorize it and do an auto ethnography or I mean what's what's next what's the what's happening with the martial arts connection in your work um yeah I'd like to I'd like to you know do an ethnography of, of all of this uh, you know build a project or something around around this um I think one of the first um tasks you know is to link what martial arts can do or not do of course uh in relations to feminist movements um and i think feminist movements have had multiple uh, tasks for the past 50 60 years uh on 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 let's say three levels you know subjectivities meaning performances um socio-political systems including first and foremost the, the, the separation between private and public spheres and um and the ideologies and the fantasies about gender and and, and and masculine and feminine roles and so as we said you know martial arts as a historically masculine sphere as a transgressive violent space is a phenomenal creative practice for every aspect of those three levels you know mm. because you have transgressive gender performances or masquerades mm. you know, uh, transgression of classic limits between public and private. So those are interesting ingredients for, for feminist movements. Again, not to say it's easy, universal or accepted, but yeah. 
interesting and, and provoking. I mean, I, I think so. I, I think that you raised some, because we, we kicked around some emails earlier before we, before we agreed to, to do this. And, and you were asking questions about masculinity and like vulnerability being kind of, and also compassion, you asked about compassion because in, in any training scenario, if, there's, if it's two equals, if you're rolling, if you're sparring with, with someone who's more or less your equal, you can go close to 100% because it's fairly equal. But if it's obvious that one person is much better than the other person, you quite quickly get a, 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 a kind of caring, sometimes, the, the ideal scenario is one which you, the, the, the more experienced or better person coaches the, 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 the newer or, or the less, um, the less um, accomplished person. So you kind of were asking about, well, what's the place of compassion um, and also like vulnerability? You know, you, you, yeah. if I train with someone who's bigger than me, better than me, younger than me, I am relying on them not smashing me. They have, to, I, I'm, I'm, they have to be compassionate, right? And I have to lay myself bare, essentially. Like, I'm like, I'm here, you could destroy me. <laughs> but I'm hoping, and that, that's all done. It's not done in words, is it? That's, that's done in a almost spontaneous ethos that arises. I mean, is, is that the kind of thing you were thinking about when you were asking questions about vulnerability and masculinity and compassion? Yeah. Something else. Yeah. You know, if we if we accept that martial arts is a discursive construction that encompasses so much from our lived experiences, then martial arts training is lived experiences training. And within this, we can dive into martial arts training as a form of intimacy training. And the intimacy training itself could be subdivided into, I don't know, vulnerability training, compassion training, empathy training, and so mm. on. You know, how do you respond when you're attacked? How do you respond when you hurt someone? Mm -hmm. um, there's, I have an anecdote, but it goes to a larger context. I, I, one of my sparring partner once, more than once actually, <laughs> hit me with a, with a pretty powerful jab that I did not see coming. And I, I, I reacted by, by saying, oh, <laughs> sorry, are you okay? And, <laughs> and she, was, she was so surprised. She was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm the one who hit you. You're the one who got yeah. hit. <laughs> and so you she, apologized, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, did I hurt your fist? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. my nose or your fist? Um, and but that was so so reminiscent of the many, many times um, someone, you know, jostled me on the street or on the subway yeah. and, and, and before anything else, really, I had the, the, the kind of reflex of saying, oh, sorry, I apologize. Um, so there was, there was empathy and compassion when I was asking if she was okay, but I realized how misplaced um, they were. So what kinds of you know relations are performed sometimes theatrically sometimes performatively mm -hmm. and how can martial arts offer this safe space for performing or redefining yeah instances? i mean i have i have speculations i mean you can probably have, have work it out from what i'm suggesting that when i did a screamer which is like hitting with sticks punching kicking there's some grappling that was very, um, very macho, very tough, very, um, it's very closed. You have to have this kind of armor around you and you have it, your guard and it has to be really strong. And, and you have become this like individual unit. Um, but then when you do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which is the opposite, you don't hit at all. There's no weapons. Um, it, it's wrestling. There's, it, it, it encourages different kinds of relationship with the other, right? And um, um, and in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, you can kind of co-mingle and, and there is then no unity like you, like physically, physiologically, mechanically, biomechanically, be, you have to use the other and become, you become part of them in different ways for leverage and so on. Whereas in a screamer, it's just 100% you, you, you steamroller through someone, you just, you, you crush them. So I'm wondering, the same way that you did a cartography of the manosphere, like you map it, 
I'm wondering if that if there's a mapping of different structures of intimacy, different constructions or performances in that moment, events or of identity. So like one type of martial art might be much more, much more acquire aggressive individualism. I'm doing my thing and I'm going to knock you out. Whereas another one involves much more co-mingling and, and, and physical intimacy. And it occurred to me that you do, if you do Kaju Kenpo, which is karate, judo, Kenpo, which are three different, they, they sort of have three different kinds of ranges. Mm. Like judo is a is a co-mingling with the other. You come together, your hips have to be under their hips, you throw them, you might land on them, and that's the whole part of the movement, which is a different dynamic to I am going to punch you in the throat, right? That's yeah. different, right? <laughs> um, I mean, what do you think? Just I know that you haven't necessarily thought about this, but what do you do you think there's anything in that different structures of intimacy, different structures of the self in relation to the other i think they are you know necessarily i think they go to both the sports sporting discipline the, the martial arts in particular that we're talking about whether it is you know brazilian jiu-jitsu or karate or judo or boxing and it goes also to the context of the training or the competition or whatever uh, the people the the, the the individuals that are performing uh, the, the, the the training um i guess i guess you can have you know martial art like brazilian jiu-jitsu who will at the beginning be more intimate than of course you know boxing and yeah. but it, it it goes to what are people willing to give and receive, you know, during training? Uh, if you have a bad sparring partner uh, yeah. or bad wrestling partner, uh, you won't get near his or her intimacy and you won't get near yeah. the kind of, um, I don't know how to say it, but it won't, it won't nourish you in the same way as um, I was just thinking about nourishing, not not in that term, but in terms of your, what your relationship to yourself. So, one's physical, psychological, emotional relationship with oneself as a body, as a unit, as a as an entity. Um, I mean, do you think there's a there's a, a gender or identity, either politics or, or issue? There is is in what ways might martial arts be feminist or anti-feminist in terms of the reason I ask is because I think that different different bodily practices different regi training regimes hobbies that you do change your own relationship to your own body and your own sense of self um, most obvious example for me would be that I had a, a an epigastric hernia which is just just below my solar plexus <clears throat> and I had an operation on that like 20 years ago or something but I still would feel phantom pains there I don't like people jabbing me or punching me in the obviously in the solar plexus area I, I don't like that but because of the scar right and I would worry about that worry 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 often and I was very physically aware of it but as soon as I started uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu where you have people crawling all over you and stuffing their knees into your belly and I just stopped thinking about it like it's just gone and and also, you know, as a as a man, you worry about fat and you don't want to take your T-shirt off in the summer because because you look a bit fat. But since I've started to do that, I don't care. I, it's just like I am me and I know that I'm I'm quite fit and strong. I don't care about that, the, the cosmetic stuff anymore. I mean, obviously, I do a bit, but I have a much more accepting relationship with it so I'm wondering if if from your perspective in terms of the, the interest that you bring to this if what you think the kind of like the the, the the feminist or maybe not feminist issues are around that relationship to self I think it's a it's a very interesting question and I think um again if you consider martial arts as kind of a an addition of micro interactions in which we reflect on what's important to us. Um, one of those interactions is that everything is temporary 
and that um, people don't necessarily care about things the way you care about them. So I don't know. It can, when you were talking about it, it reminded me of you know those firing moments when you can't wait for it to be over because you're just struggling too much. And it's awful. And it's the longest three, four, five minutes of your life. <laughs> and then and then when it's over, it's just like, okay, well, it's over. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's go again. <laughs> let's have a drink, let's go. <laughs> yeah. And it it really brings perspective, you know, to your to your to your sense of self, to your body, to your emotions, to your you know, our bodies are media. We use them as mediations for emotions, for experiences, for relations. We're not yeah. simply subjected to them. We can we can be, you know, but yeah. we, we, we also in, inhabit them reflexively. We we overfill or we underfill pressure, punches, strangling, not simply because we are used to them, but because of our, you know, because of our environment and experiences will lead us to this or this kind of interpretation and communication of physical contact or physical um, um, hurting like you like you said about about the way you were feeling um, mm. so I have been hit quite hard and just mumbled under my breath and I have been hit mm. not Sorry. that hard <laughs> and yelled <laughs> you know so um, you can <clears throat> suffer and not say a thing and not suffer that much and, and complain all the time uh, so of yeah. course there's this question of embodiment of values idealizations and projects but um, um, uh, an interesting question is also how do we choose consciously or unconsciously to use our bodies as media for transformations or confirmations what is the first space mm -hmm. that we strategically engage with? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there's a whole interesting set of thinking and uh, set of questions to think about around clothing, mm. uh, performance of one's identity, and um, and so on. Yeah, I mean, the number of the number of martial arts T-shirts that I have is quite embarrassing, really, for a middle-aged man. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I should have grown out of martial. I'm wearing a yin yang now, for God's sake. Um. <laughs> I think I think, I think it, it relates to fantasies. You know, what you fantasize about yourself and this environment and yeah. those practice that you've engaged with, and fantasies play a huge part in intimacy. Yeah. And there are it, it's parts. also it, it's it's kind of um, tribal, isn't it? In the sense that. If, if, if I get into something and you're not into it, you don't understand, or like, oh, you're into something, like you're into like Kaju Kembo and, and, and I might look at that and go, but that's madness. Why would you do that when there's, when there's Jiu Jitsu or when there's Tai Chi or something? You know, if someone's doing boxing, someone else is doing wrestling, it's like, they might not understand why the other person could possibly be into that and so you put these flags on your body and go and you're like looking for affiliation like are you like me do you like what i like are we the same <laughs> it, yeah That's, yeah there's a strong sense of communities of course and it's necessary i think when you again <laughs> you play so much with distance and bodies and yeah potentially hurting someone uh, you have to have this strong sense of um, affiliations you have to have uh, spaces where you just exchange more calmly uh, mm -hmm. where you open up to someone where you, you know. okay so here's a question um, when you um, approach any of this stuff I guess anything that all of your um, different pieces of work that and studies and projects that you've had on different issues of, of, of gender or gender violence or exclusion or, or misrepresentation. What, what's your main theoretical framework that you that what's your go to theory like the one that you always rely on and will that be still useful when you think about intimacies in martial arts 
what do you think is going to be your like major enabling theoretical framework reflexive modernity reflexivity individualism and their articulations with feminism feminist movements gender performances and, and gender roles you know um and that that has been my framework for many years and when i got into martial arts as an academic of course i was quick to dive into the scientific literature to better understand what i was doing where it was coming from what it could mean in terms of culture and power and feminism and so mm -hmm. that's that's where i read a lot of ethnographic studies you know that were based on the study of interactions and micro interactions and that's okay. where I, I, I quickly thought that like what if people were actually getting into martial arts as a way to get um, micro interactions mm -hmm. to experiment and shall i say test gender performances and social roles and yeah. how can i connect this to the epistemology that i have been studied these past few years namely reflexive individualism and mm -hmm. all contemporary love and sexualities mm -hmm. and can we understand martial arts in terms of new intimacies um at a specific time in our societies where where love and sexualities are more open but more insecure too more risky yeah and martial arts is a field where risk is omnipresent and we, we play with it so yeah. is, is there i don't know i don't have the answer but is there a link between those two risks okay probably i think okay. <laughs> i mean too, you also um we talked a little bit on email about um the work of lauren berlant yeah the, the late great lauren berlant um who wrote about cruel optimism and mm -hmm. and compassion and um <clears throat> and so on i mean reading reading cruel optimism she she's writing about the way in which you know it's like say for instance the american dream and it becomes a it's a fantasy attachment that that can become cruel because the more you're attached to it the more you can ultimately do damage to your own kind of self-flourishing and i was reading that obviously always thinking about whether the things i'm attached to are cruel in the sense that they're going to hurt me it's not going to enable me or enable me to flourish and i i kind of think that in the realm of martial arts i mean you've read that work right i mean you that was familiar to you and um in, in the realm of martial arts, that fantasy, the fantasy attachments to some things can be cruel, right? Like the fantasy attachment to the idea of invincibility or eternal youth or chi, you know, chi mm -hmm. power, boom. That's all cruel, but actually the fun stuff, the interacting, the, the intimacy, the, the, the going to a class twice a week and, and meeting some of your, your friends that you hang out with and you, that's not cruel, right? That's actually, straightforwardly good and positive i think we all agree right i mean yeah, sure. not sure. all not all attachments are cruel not all optimisms are cruel i think not really a question there I think. I think, no 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 it's, it's interesting i think it, it 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 goes to authenticity maybe you know the idea that you have authentic real pure energy uh, energies the chi or <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 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 yeah, sorry. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I was just looking at, I looked at the time. I, I don't want to keep you too long. And I don't also want these podcast episodes to be more than an hour. So I was thinking about, you know, what shall we talk about for the last few minutes, maybe? And I think we should talk about the future. And I think that, um, so, so next year in 2023, we've got the Martial Arts Studies Conference in Sheffield. Now you've got that date in your diary, right? I do. Because I told you to put it there. <laughs> <laughs> and there's also a, an as yet unannounced top secret conference in France that I shouldn't advertise because I've been asked not to say anything about it um, in case I offend someone <laughs> and then we lose funding or something. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but there's also probably a conference um, in June in, uh, on similar, similar themes. So hopefully you might be presenting some of your work at one or both of those conferences. 
I don't know. I hope so. Yes. Yeah. I'm still figuring out, you know, whether to draw on existing um, uh, content and data and you know, fields like the manosphere, or if I will have had the opportunity to begin some kind of ethnographic research. Maybe, maybe both. Yeah. Hopefully. Or some kind of theoretical survey of speculative yeah. possibilities. I think when it comes to presentations, this is my preference is always for, <laughs> I don't like people telling me about their methodology. I like people <laughs> telling me about their ideas. Right? You know, in the 20, <laughs> if, you're, if you're sitting in a day long conference and in every 20 minute paper, people spend 15 minutes telling you about their methodology and one minute telling you about their theory, four minutes telling you about their results, you get tired, but if but if you'll just say, I think this, <laughs> I reckon yeah. this. Yeah. That's... <laughs> Do you? There's a. You have to trust people for the for the methodology of it. But then you ask them, well, what's your methodology? On what basis yeah. can you say this? Yeah. Rather than I'm going to spend more than half of my presentation <laughs> giving you some methodological considerations. I think people just want to know, like, this is what I reckon. This is what I've observed. I haven't finished observing it yet. These are my theories. And that's that's a great, I think you should, well, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but you know, like early theoretical kind of spectrum of possibilities. I would love that. I, it's almost, I guess. <laughs> that's what I'll do. You do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess it's always difficult when you come to a new field, you know, you wanna prove to people <laughs> that you're like serious and rigorous and that you've done the right thing. and then you're like, Mm. But uh, but ideas are far more, uh, by essence, thought provoking than methodology. Yeah, I think so. I got, but I, I often think that you can you can start from an observation of something like my experience in a club or what I think about this film or this documentary or something, and you can shine different theories on it and see what they can see in it. Um, that's always been my, pr I think that's more stimulating. That's why I always like really kind of philosophers who throw loads of ideas out all the time, like one after another, after another, after another. So I'm quite into, as you know, Peter Sloterdijk at the moment, and it's just, mm. it's crazy. Some might say, some might say it's really orientalist, it's really masculine, it's really, it's not Marxist and therefore bad. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, anyway, we've, we've veered into what I want to do. This is this is just about me now, <laughs> but you're going to be there, which is interesting too. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> I mean, this entire podcast, this whole this whole idea for this whole podcast is let's just talk about stuff I want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I tell you what, I'll just say, so thank you for humouring me, but thank you for um, bringing your um, your ideas and your research and your insight and your and your thoughts into this. Um, and yeah, we'll be in touch. But I'll, if, if I don't see you before, I'll see you like summer next year, summer 2023. Hopefully, yeah. Fabulous. Okay. So, Celine Moran, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the invite.